Well, we're glad to have you today. If you open your Bibles to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew in the 19th chapter. When we got into the Christmas story, we studied the life of Joseph. And his struggle within the Word of God for truth. And what we discovered in the conclusion of, of Joseph's dilemma over Mary's pregnancy was when uh, divorce is not optional. When divorce is not optional. And today, we're carrying that over to when remarriage is not optional and when it is optional. So in Matthew, the 19th chapter, we're looking at verses 1 through 9. They confronted Jesus with this very idea. The, the Pharisees of the law. And here's how it reads. And pay careful attention to what Jesus, what they asked Jesus and what he told them. When Jesus had finished these words, he departed from Galilee and came into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. Large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to Jesus testing him, and that's where I pick up our story, testing him and asking, asking, uh, testing him and asking, watch their question now. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Right? For any reason at all. Their, their argument, their legal argument, hey, Rhonda, see if you can help those kids. Well, they, they know where they're going. I, I should have said the kids to help you. Okay. Well, since you parked your boat, we're glad to have you. Here we are in Matthew 19. The Pharisees in verse 3 have asked Jesus a question, is it lawful? And they're out of Deuteronomy 24. They're in Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. Is it lawful? That's why they're using the word lawful. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Watch this now. For any reason at all. Now that's really important. He answered. Listen, how simple his answer is. Listen to what it is. What's the Bible say? See, they came in to trap him with a question out of the law. They came well prepared in Matthew 24, 1 through 4, to trap him, to test him, to trap him. All right? And he asked them, what's the Bible say? See, they know, I'll, I'll spend a moment with you. They think they know. Agreed? They think they know. They've come in with a Trump question, boom, to hit them. They think they know the answer to that question. They're waiting for him to give them a reason to bring charges against them. It's a corrupt, it's a corrupt government. <laughs> These people are evil. Now watch this. He said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? He didn't go to Deuteronomy 4. He went to Genesis 1. The reason they don't understand divorce is because they don't understand marriage. The, no, no, no. the reason they don't understand divorce is because they don't understand marriage as God prescribed it. From the beginning, made them from the beginning, male and female. He's, he's, he's in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. He's in, if you've got a study Bible, it's going to tell you that. Now watch. Then he added, verse 5, 
For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. You know what he did? He just gave a second scripture on marriage. Now, look, what, were they, what was their question about? Divorce. It could be a gay question at this point. Right? It could be a gay question. I mean, we get to Pearl and Gadiel and say, hey, they, uh, you have the right answer. Right? They're talking about divorce for any reason because they don't understand God's intention of marriage. So he gave them two famous undisputed arguments for marriage. One from Genesis 1, 26, 27, and one from Genesis 2, 18 through 25. Because he just quoted Genesis 2, 24. In verse 6, he does a newology. You say, I've never heard that. I know. He gave him a newology a new idea to Genesis 2.24. Here's what he said. This is not in Deuteronomy 24, and it's not in Genesis 1 or Genesis 2. He gave a newology. He gave a new word about it. A new revelation about it. Watch what he said. In verse 6, Matthew 19.6. So... Talking about marriage. So they are no longer two singles, but one flesh married. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Right? What was their, what was their whole purpose in coming to ask Jesus a question to trap him legally? It's a legal question, right? What was his answer? What did, what's the word of God say? What, but listen, not about divorce. He says, what did the Bible say about marriage? Isn't that interesting? Because they're all caught up in divorce which is an attack upon the marriage because they don't understand God's intent of marriage. You understand that? Be careful in your life, dear hearts. Be careful in your lives, in your, in your life. So they are no longer two. When you're single, it's one plus one is two. When you get married, one plus one is what? One. See, that's marriage math. When you're single, one and one is two. When you get married, one and one is one. The two shall become what? One. one. The two shall become one. Then he said in newology, he gave a newology that says what? Let what? No one? What? Separate. Be separate what? The one and one from what? One. Don't let anybody separate the one and one that's become one. Listen to me. Not even you. Are there grounds? Mm hmm. And we'll talk about them today. Are there grounds for divorce? Yes. Are there grounds for remarriage? Yes. Are there grounds. I, is it a possibility I could be married and didn't have rights to remarry? Yes. But listen, what Jesus is after is two people getting married, two, one and one plus two. When they get married, it's one, one plus one is what? Uh, uh, even that math would work in our schools today. I mean, you, whatever answer you gave would be all right, right? We'll just vote on it. They said to him, they're not content with what he's told them about marriage. 
because marriage affects divorce. If you saw what God says about marriage, it'll affect divorce. But if you throw what God says about it, then everything's up for grabs. He said to them, why? They said to him, why then? Second question. This is their second question. Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? See, they think they got him again. He said to them, what's the Bible say? Did you bring a Bible with you today? Huh? Did you bring your Bible with you today? You know why we provide Bibles in the church, in your pew? Because people show up without them. You got your driver's license? You got your driver's license with you? Watch what he told them now. Why divorce? Well, why did Moses command to give a, her a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, because of the hardness of heart. Let me tell you, the number one cause of divorce is what? Biblically, what is it? Nope. Hardness of hearts. How do I know that? Jesus told me. Right? Let no man separate. Well then why do they why did Moses allow it? Number one cause of divorce hardness of men's hearts. And who is that heart? Listen to me now. Who is that heart against? Who, who decreed marriage in the human race? Huh? God Almighty. Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. The hardness of heart to believe that you can go against the Word of God and do whatever you want to do is based on the hardening of your heart towards the things that God says. Marriage, God created marriage just as he created man. You can't do anything you want. In Christ, because of the hardness of men's heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, where would that be? What does he mean from the beginning? That wasn't so. What, what's he talking about? Genesis 1 and Genesis... Right? I'm just telling you what... The, I'm just reading the Bible and asking you. See, listen to me. You can hear, but you often don't listen. Have you ever raised kids? You got kids? They often hear, but they don't listen. What did I tell you? How many times do I have to tell you? <laughs> you got a kid? Well, but, but he said only? Am I the only one that grew up in a family like that? From the beginning, Genesis 1, 26, 27, Genesis 2, 18 through 25. From the beginning, it has not been that way. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, now watch this. We're back to Deuteronomy 24. That's where they wanted to go. They, did, they didn't understand how big a deal marriage is to God. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, Except for immorality. That is not a Greek word. That's an English interpretation of poinia. In Hebrew, 
it would have been Erwa Dabar. Except for fornication, is what the Bible should say. I bet if you got an old King James, they probably said that. They, they mix words like we do today. We change our language, right? When I grew up, words meant something completely different than they, than they mean today. I would never buy a dictionary out that was produced in 2000. I'd go back and buy a dictionary. You know, what English words mean anymore. Changing pronouns and everything. This is stupid. Well, whoever divorces his wife except for fornication and marries another commits adultery to the first wife. That's Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, by the way. So let's have a word of prayer, and I'm going to get after this because we're in deep trouble in America. We are in deep, deep trouble. We are in deep trouble. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ in America is in deep, deep trouble. We don't know how to bring our people out of all these bad mistakes. How to correct these lies in their life. And so the churches remain silent on it. I'm going to give it to you today. Let us pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we come to you today because as a believer, we know in the church age we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, it's made our body a mobile church. Our bodies become the temple of God, not the temple of man, not the temple of fornication. It's become the temple of God. And the Christian must understand the importance of his body in regard to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. In this indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, when we assemble for Bible study, it is important that the Holy Spirit teach us the truth of the Word of God according to John 14, 26. Teach and recall. He's got to be able to teach it to us to recall it in dire times of our life off the front burner. I'm afraid, Father, we no longer study the Word of God for spiritual truth. Awaken us, Father. Awaken us. I thank you, Father, for the principle of 1 John 1, 9 that says, if I confess my sin, that sin that God has me on, that I am conscious of, my conscience convicts me, the Holy Spirit convicts me, the Word of God convicts me. How many more convictions do I need to confess it? When I confess my personal sin, Father, I am so thankful for the work of Christ from the cross because His blood sanctifies me. And, and, and cleanses me from my personal sin. It restores me to the power over the flesh, the power of the Holy Spirit. I have the power to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and not in power of the flesh. The Word of God gives me the power to live by faith and not by sight. I pray for that today as we sub look at the subject about divorce and remarriage. Teach us, Father. Teach us. We've got to teach other people these truths in Jesus name. Amen. <clears throat> Let me read to you Deuteronomy 24 1. When a man takes a wife and marries, and marries her and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her English writing of that. That's Derwa, that's Erwa Dabar. Erwa Dabar in Hebrew. Jesus translated that into Greek as pornea. Because she has found some in he has found he has found some indecency in her. And writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it. And puts, and puts her 
uh, hand and puts it in her hand and sends her away from his house. That's what they have brought before Jesus to get him to explain divorce to them because he, he's been opposed to it with an exception of pornea. Because what they, how they translated indecency, erwadabar, listen to me, was for any reason. Do you know we have that in America today? Do you know what it's called? Well, you better learn this. Uh, no, no fault divorce. No fault. You know what no fault means? No consent. You know how you have to get married? Put a gun to her head, right? Or the dad puts a gun to your head, right? It's by consent, is it not? Do you take... <laughs> do you take... <laughs> There's, it's by consent, not divorce. Not divorce. It always has been that way, and you had to have consent to get out of divorce in America, like the Word of God teaches. There's virtually been no cry from the church over that. And it's destroying marriages, it's destroying families in the church as well as outside the church. Listen to this specific phrase in Deuteronomy 24.1. Watch this now. She, if she finds no favor in his eyes. Write this down on your piece of paper. It's not, I don't think it's on your paper. Proverbs 18, 22. Write this down now. Well, you need to understand this. Here's what Proverbs 18, 22 says. He who finds a wife, that is, find in the Word of God, by biblical standards, finds a wife by biblical standards. Listen, believers marry believers. 1 Corinthians 7, 39. You are, as a believer, you're not permitted to marry an unbeliever. You're not permitted to go into that relationship knowing that person's unsaved. 1 Corinthians 7, 39. Come on. Well, nobody walked out on me yet. He who finds a wife, that's a wife in the Lord. That's, this is a word of God statement. Who finds a wife in the Lord, finds a good thing, and has, watch this, and has obtained favor in God's eyes. You know what favor is in the Old Testament? It's grace in the New Testament. Favor in the Old Testament is grace in the New Testament. It's all about God. Favor is all about God. Did you marry a believer? Then you found, you found a wife in the Lord. And when you found her in the Lord, not in the woods, not at the beach, it's okay to find them there, by the way, but they better be in the Lord. has found favor in the eyes of God. When you look at your wife, you should look at her with the eyes of God in favor. Do you understand that? Do you know how hard it is to find a godly woman or a godly man to get married today? I require... Three months counseling. And I quit marrying people because they would, not, they would not pay attention to the Word of God, what the Word of God says about marriage. They went in, they would rather go in blind and learn on the, on the run. Yeah, well... When you look at Deuteronomy 24, you got to look at Proverbs 18, 22. 
If you look at your wife, here's Deuteronomy 24, and she's committed, or he's either he or she has committed fornication, she's lost favor in the eyes of God, and she's lost favor in the eyes of man, or her husband, or his wife. Do you understand that? I can explain it again if you haven't got it. Because you need to get it. I'm telling you what the Bible says. What's the Bible say, Ron? Here's what the Bible says. Is that your opinion? I don't know. You study it and get your own. Right? I've given you the passages. All you got to do is read them. All right. All right. So they give them a trap question. Right? In verse 3, they gave him a trap, trap question. And the trap question was for any reason. Because by the time we get to the coming of Jesus, the nation of Israel is apostate. They have declined, declined. Do you realize when Jesus is there, they are so deep into decline that they only have 40 years left and they don't even know it. 40 years from the time Jesus entered into Israel, Israel will be no more. As a nation of favor. As a nation of favor. They didn't realize how short a time, and listen, they dug their own grave. They dug their own grave. America Everybody's got a shovel and they're digging their own grave today because they will not pay attention what the Word of God says. Even the church of Jesus Christ will not pay attention to the Word of God. And we're digging a grave and your grandchildren and your children are going to be buried in it. And it's not going to be a pleasant place to be. And it's coming. Let me show you some stats. Let me show you some stats. Let me show you some stats. In 1940, there was 2% divorces, under 2% divorces in America. In 1970, this is really important idea, 50 years later, we're in a deep decline, and marriage is becoming routine but difficult. In the 70s, you could get a divorce, but it was difficult. Then it came along with this goofy stuff about no-fault divorce, where you don't have to have counseling, you don't have to have discussion, you don't have to have prayer, you don't have to go back to the church and the pastor and all that kind of stuff to sort it all out in your life, to know whether or not you have rights for divorce and rights for marriage. Since 1970, there's been a steady, I mean, it was a slow dripping up to 70. And from 70 to 80, it was like lights out. In 80, in 1980, in the baby boomer generation, divorce rate jumped 290%. Who can even wrap your mind around that? 290% with the baby boomers. And by the way, those baby boomers that are still alive are still doing it. In 2022, 60% of America is divorcing between the ages of 25 and 39. Can you believe that? I mean, your diaper hasn't been off long. Surely the diaper in, a, in the world of evil. Do you know that today, in 2022, as it closed out and 23 enters, that the United States is the third highest nation of divorce in the world? The beacon of the light of Christ. The beacon of the light of Christ the United States of America is the third largest company that says, throw your marriages out. Throw your children out with them. My, my, my. Listen to this, Alabama. We're number three. Of all the states, 
We tie with Wyoming as the highest rate of divorce. Uh, Alabama. Yeah, jeez. When I came to the state of Alabama in 58, it was hard to get a kiss from a girl at the door. Walk her to the door, and he almost had to sign a contract with her mom and dad. Fifty-eight. I met a young, on fire girl, an Alabama and a young lady on fire for God that led me to Christ. Now, we're tied up with Wyoming. I would think, Wyoming? Are there girls in Wyoming? <laughs> I've been to a lot of places in America. I've never went to Wyoming. never have a desire to go. And I know, I know uh, Hope and them. you got some people out in Wyoming, don't you? Well, they move to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. I just know it's wild west out there. I do know that. But I never had a desire to go there. Right? I never, it's probably a beautiful place. I don't know. I just, Wyoming. I mean, like I could, if you can spell it, you'd probably go there. But I don't know. Watch this. When both people get divorced and they both remarry, 90% divorce rate again. Look at that. Look how that number's jumped. You get married, you get divorced because I, I, I'm just tired of her. I, I'm just tired of her. Or I'm tired of him. I think I could do better. I don't know what your argument is. Won't be any good, but it... What are the odds you're going to remarry and find that? Oh, if I could just get out of this relation to get into another relationship. Oh, I know I could find the goose that lays the golden egg. Right? Yeah. The odds are you found it and then got rid of it. Probably your smartest choice was your first one. That's been my conclusion as a pastor. I meet these people all the time. They come eh. Yeah. Watch this, so out of that 90% getting divorced again, 65% of the children live with a single mother and live under the national poverty line. And the primary reason is they can't get any money from a do-nothing husband. Boy, would I hold his feet to the fire. What can you do about it today? <laughs> You go to court, you're going to take him to court. The court's screwier than, the, than your divorce is. My, my, my. That breaks my heart to think that. Breaks my heart to think. And listen, we see him. We see him out here in Moody. Willie, we're dealing with these. We're dealing, we're trying to rescue. We are trying to rescue these young people out in Moody in Sinclair County. We're out every day trying to rescue them. Where every day we're out trying to rescue these young people from in Moody and St. Clair County. Maybe the stats would be staggering out here. These stats are probably even higher because so many don't marry but live together. Oh my God, don't even start me on that one. You got to quit that. You're killing America. You're killing the church, you're killing America, and you're killing your testimony for Christ. When one becomes one, they're one. Just because you don't get married don't mean you're not married. You having sex with her? Well, hello. Hello. You having sex with her? Well, how about that? 
You know, you know, when I started dating, you know, my mother said, my mother set me down, single mother, set me down. So let me tell you a little story how things are going to be when you start dating, Ron. I said, okay. Of course, you know, you know everything at that age. Well, here's my mother. My mother, what my mother ever said she would do, my mother always did it. She said, well, let me tell you, you go with a girl, take a good look at her, because if you get her pregnant, she's going to be your wife. I thought, why? Run that one more time through me that I didn't miss anything, because I, I started to sleep when she started, well, let me tell you about the birds and the bees. Right? And she said, if you think I'm kidding, and you know what? Every person I dated, I thought about that. Because I know my mother, either that or she'd had a funeral. My mother was the real deal. My mother, E.F. Hutton, E.F. was in the room. So let's take a look at this today. I'm going to teach you a little more in the first half, and then I'm going to come back to the second half. I'm going to give you seven biblical cases for divorce with rights for remarriage and without rights for remarriage. Here's the first. If you're, and listen to me closely now, if, you're mar if your marital mate is found guilty of pornea, that's fornication, which is any illicit sexual act outside of marriage. Matthew 5, 31, 32 supports Matthew 19, 9 and Deuteronomy and corrects the thinking of Deuteronomy 24, 1 when it talks about some indecency found. That's pornea. Jesus transliterated erwadabar to pornea, the Greek idea. What does this mean? What is pornea? When you study the passages in the scriptures of the New Testament, you will find such things as adultery, prostitution, uh, homosexuality, pederasty, uh, pedophilia, incest, and bestiality, such things as that. I know you don't read the Bible, but if you did, you could find it in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 7, chapter verse 2. You could find it in 1 Timothy 1, 9 through 11. You could find it in Ephesians 4, 17 through 21. And in Deuteronomy 22, 22, they call it evil in a nation. When this thing begins to be rampant, it is, per, it is, it is spreading evil in a nation like wildfire. We're there. We are there. We are there. Pornea. You know what, we're, you know what pornea was in the Old Covenant? In the Old Testament, you know what it was called in the Old Covenant? In the Old Testament, listen to me, the phallic cult. And it destroyed nations after nations. It was called a phallic cult. Well, just look up the word phallus and you will get the idea. It is evil committed against divine institutions. And what's the primary cause? Hardness of hearts. And please don't forget that. Because we like to use every excuse in the world. And it boils down to one. Hardness of heart against God. The hardness of a heart against God and the truth of the word of God. Let the Bible be your guide. Don't let what the world tells you. Well, I can do what I want. I'm 21. I can do what I want. I don't care if you're 101. You still have to obey God. Age has got nothing to do with obedience to God. Your heart. Love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and all of your, all of your mind. Love God. My, my, my. My, my, my. 
when your heart goes against God that way for personal pleasure that's against God's will, it develops scar tissue, scar tissue on your heart. The place of reasoning. You know what the, you know what the heart in man, I'm not talking about the one that pumps blood, I'm talking about the one that directs behavior. That's where the word of God goes. If you believe in your heart, if you believe in your heart, if you believe in your heart, the Bible over and over tells you that. What do you mean it's your life and you can do it? What do you mean it's my life and I can do with it what I want? Are you born again? Then your, wife, your, your life does not belong to you. It has been crucified with Christ nevertheless. Right? It is not I, but he. It is not my will, but his will be done. This is not brain surgery talk, but it is heart surgery. So, the innocent party, if your mate is engaged in pornea, the innocent party has right for marriage, but not with a guilty one. That's Deuteronomy. Point number two. If a mate guilty of pornea remarries and gets divorced again, now watch this. He, he gets married. This is typical. His wife, you know, burned his toast two mornings in a row. That's enough for me. For any reason. Not biblical. Come on. Gets divorced, and then he goes like, oh. Marries another woman thinking, oh, this, I will marry up. <laughs> you always marry down. Oh, you'll learn it. <laughs> you'll learn it because you'll learn it the hard way. This is a way to learn it the easy way. He goes like, oh, geez, I made a mistake. So he gets rid of that woman and wants to go back to the first because that, that woman looks pretty good now. <laughs> you know what she says at the door? No way, Jose. Even if he's not Spanish. No way. Listen. No way, Jose. No way, Jose. Where do I get that information? Well, I get it from Matthew 5, 31, 32. I get it from Matthew 19, 1 through 9. You know why? You know why Jesus was so opposed to it? Because we should be. You know why? Because when you marry him, when you when you get divorced improperly, then and start getting into the you get into a cycle of remarriage, all you do is it, listen, the rate goes up to 90%. You start going through women just like a beer bottle. I don't know where that came from, but that's when marriage is not optional. Remarriage is not optional. I'm gonna do one more now. We'll take we'll take a break in a minute. I might get a couple of them before we take a break, but anyhow. If a guilty mate marries again, the innocent mate, now watch this. This kind of the innocent mate of the first marriage is free to to marry again based on point two because she can't marry the first guy back again, right? If you get divorced and he remarries and then says and and you stay where you're supposed to and you stay in your lane and he goes back, <laughs> you know how they do. You say, no way, Jose. Because you don't have rights to remarry him. You know why? Because he's dumb. He'll do it to you again. You're not permitted because what this guy is going to get into, or gal, is into this idea of remarrying. And it's a cyclic idea. Why did, what was the cause of the first divorce? 
Hardness. Will you not learn that? Hardness of hearts. So how's that? Unless that's changed, how's that going to change, right? Well, I made a mistake. That's, that don't correct the hardening of hearts. You got to take that hardening. You got to take that callousness off, which is old man thing. You got to take that off and put no man thinking on. You've got to learn to live in Christ. Christ should be the supreme goal of your life. Christ should be the supreme goal of your life at any age. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I've been crucified with Christ. Never let it's not I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. Why isn't that the marching order in your life? If the guilty mate marries again, the isn't mate of the first marriage is free because she can't marry him again. But listen to me, she can only marry another person in the Lord. He has to be a believer. She should be, she'd be smarter the second round, shouldn't she? You would think so. The fourth, the death, the death of a mate or ex-mate, in other words, you got, got divorced and he remarried, yada, yada, how many times don't matter, and he dies, gives the surviving mate rights of remarriage, but only in the Lord. Otherwise, this is another example. If you don't marry in the Lord, as I hear so many people, well, you know, I'm 60 years old and I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Some of the dumbest people I've learned. I'm in a category now, and I, I'm with these people all the time. What goes on at nursing homes is worse than high school. Did you know that? Well, come with me and I'll give you a, a retirement home ministry to shock you. These people float around at night and they can take a look. I didn't know where I was. I mean, what a line that is. Huh? Must have been something in the food today. I don't know what made me crazy. So watch those little old people that you put in a nursing home. They might have a smile on their face all the time. I gave you scripture on it. I gave you scripture, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 2 and 3 and 39. If a mate uses no false gimmicks, they would say like incompatibility, for example. Actually, it means without consent. In Matthew 19, it was for any reason. Just come up with any reason. Right? And remarries, if a person uses the default gimmick and remarries, it gives the believer, the ex-mate, rights for remarriage. Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, Jeremiah 3, 1. But even then, you can only marry in the Lord. A believer can only marry in the Lord. You marry another believer. 1 Corinthians 7.39. Uh, number six. Desertion of a marriage by an unbeliever. You could have, both of you could have gotten married and the salvation and all the church and all that stuff wasn't an issue. And one person gets saved in the marriage, which happened a lot in the early church, which happens a lot in America, it used to. Um, the desertion of a marriage by an unbeliever, he goes like, I, 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 I can't stand all this Christianity stuff in your life, so I want out. Gives rights to the, the deserted mate to remarry, right? 1 Corinthians 7 is a great passage on this. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 7 uh, 12 through uh, 16. Let me show that to you. Let's take a look at that. It deserves our attention. 1 Corinthians 7. But to the rest I say, he said, like in verse 10, but to the married I give instruction, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. If she does leave, she must remain single, uh, unmarried, or else be reconciled to her husband. That's, that's when you have no, no fault type thing. And the husband should not divorce his wife. But to the rest, 
I say not the Lord, that if a brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. A woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, in other words, under the roof with a Christian, with Christian values, she, does, she, does, she must not send her husband away. For the unbelieving husband, and here's the reason why, Paul says, the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife. In other words, she's, she, she's a missionary living with him. Sanctified through the wife, set apart unto the gospel. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. In other words, the believer in the home is a live-in missionary. Has brought holiness to the home. Yet, if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. Here we go. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your, save your wife? And then listen, how do you know that maybe some person in your family, God is going to raise up to be a mighty warrior for God? Now let me talk for a little bit before we go home about this thing of hardness of hearts. A great passage for you to read on this, one of many, but one good passage would be Hebrews, the third and fourth chapters. And hardness of heart may start in one area, and once it's there, it affects every area, right? When your heart is right, things, things go good. When the heart's wrong, things go... In other words, they go for right or they go for wrong, right? Wrong. No, I mean, they, right, right or wrong. So, they ask him, well, since it's in the Word of God, you said, what does the Bible say? I just read to you that Moses uh, allowed people to get divorced. To give them a certificate of divorce. So what, what, what is the deal here? And, and he explains it. He says, why, they said, why then does Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? And Jesus said, because of, the, of your hardness of hearts, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it has not been that way. Matthew 19, 7 through 9. Because marriage, you know, you'll hear people say, I hear unbelievers say that they have a really good marriage. And sometimes two unbelievers can have a really good marriage. It only becomes sticky when one gets saved and the other's not. And then the one person is saved, he was like, what about this and what about that? How about raising kids? How about let's go to biblical principles? And they go, let's go to Plato. And they go, let's, no, let's go to Paul. Then, then we can have some problems with it. But two unbelievers, they could be very compatible. They could be two wonderful people. And the divine institution of marriage could work very, very well for them. And yet you could have two believers in a marriage... It's just warfare. And it becomes, if one person gets into the hardness of hearts, it just is enormously difficult for the person who's not. Because this person is not only hard-headed, it's hard-hearted. And when he's hard-headed, it's, it's, it's maybe a mind over matter. But... When he's hard-hearted, that's his whole belief system. And until that changes, nothing will change. So you need to be aware of that. And listen, you can only work on your side of the street. In your marriage, you can only work on you. When you spend all your time pointing your finger at another person, you've paid attention to who the other, th other three fingers are pointing to. The blame game is the worst thing that you can ever do in your marriage. The blame game. You know where we find that in marriage? Genesis. Third chapter of Genesis. The blame game in marriage. Adam says, well, if you, 
He blames God. Well, if you hadn't given me that woman, I wouldn't be in this trouble. The woman says, well, if you hadn't given the serpent, I wouldn't be in this trouble. And the serpent says, I love being blamed. Because it shows I'm winning. Do you understand that? The serpent was winning. He loves all this fighting, all this shifting of blame and and all of this uproar. You know what marriages don't do anymore? They don't pray together. Somebody's got to start that ball rolling. Well, Rod, we pray, we pray at meals. Yeah. Thank you, God, for the food, but I hate my marriage. That ain't going to work. You know, you can pray one to God and then another one to yourself, and he listens to both of them and judge you on both of them. You need to pray together. I wouldn't know how to begin, Ron. Well, you say, Father, here is some of the stuff on my plate. My marriage, my family, my business, my church, my health. The first person you ought to be praying that with is your mate. And a man needs to lead. The man needs to lead. I mean, he leads in other areas. Huh? How about it, girls? He can lead. Huh? You know when he wants, when he wants to lead, don't you? Come on. One of the great problems in, Christian, in the Christian church in marriages is a lack of praying together. And I'm not, I don't mean meals. I don't mean now I lay me down to sleep or pray the Lord my soul to keep if I should die before I wake. None of that stuff. I'm talking about praying about what's on your plate. I tell you, some of the times when Jane and I would have our prayer together, we never went to bed without prayer. We prayed when we went to bed. We prayed when we got up. We prayed if I came home at lunch. We prayed whenever we had a good cause and, and we were on schedule. And sometimes when I would hear my wife speak to her father on my behalf, it touched me in ways that you could never imagine. When I heard her speak to her father, God, on my behalf, it was never antagonistic. It was never to change me. It was always about to change her. And I would think, my goodness, my wife is next to Jesus. How in the world would she be praying for my life, for her life to change? Whatever I need to be, I want to be that person in my marriage. You know why? I said to her one day, well, I, I don't get it. And she took to me to Ephesians, the fifth chapter, and explained to me the marriage between a man and a woman of two believers is Christ and the church. And I went like, and I'm a minister, and I went like, cha-ching. That's just about as personal as the word of God can become. Let me tell you, when I had a prayer need in my life, the first person I called was my wife. If I was in a hospital and a guy was dying on a bed and I was there and holding his hands, I called my wife and said, give me the support in prayer I need to get this man from point A to point B. And I knew my wife could do that. I knew my wife could do that.
And I tried to be that man in her life. I tried to be that man in her life. It didn't take me long that I was the initiator of that stuff. My wife would call me and she wouldn't have to say, I hate to bother you, honey, but the kids are yeah, 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 yeah. She never had to do that with me. In the early days, she did. After that, she didn't. I'd say, you don't have that. Listen, you got all the time. Listen, I set apart everything aside for you. When you call me, you have my full attention. That's called marriage between two believers that love God. Develop that. You've got to do that stuff. This is part of the kingdom work in marriage. Dear hearts, we've got to do this. It's never too late to get this stuff corrected. We are going to tank as a nation. We're going to tank as a church. We're going to have empty pews because we've got nothing to give people. Our life don't reflect the joy. Our marriage doesn't reflect the joy. And listen, you're eating your children. You are eating your children. That's graphic, isn't it? By the way you behave. The church is not the last, the, the home is not the last stop, it's the first stop. Because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses permitted you divorce, but from the beginning, you need to live in the beginning. It's all about marriage, and marriage is all about Christ, and Christ is all about God. Huh? Of course, if any man be in Christ. For the unbeliever, divorce attacks divine institutions of marriage and family. We've read the stats on it. For the believer, it attacks the church of Jesus Christ. It attack, when you attack your family, your marriage and your family, you attack the church of Jesus Christ. You're blowing out the candle. You're turning off the lights. Your home is all about Christ. Let that little light shine and let it shine bright. I hate this divorce rate in Alabama. We're going to correct that with our young people. We're going to correct it. So, Father, we thank you today. Study the word, talk about the excitement, things that have to go on within the body of Christ the church in a declining nation and how difficult it is even to find the working staff that is necessary in the body of Christ the church because of it. But we're content with you, Father. We're content. Discipleship is always changing. A revolving door in the church, and it's been a wonderful experience out here. It's been a wonderful experience to see young people come to the knowledge of Christ and to be excited about the study of the Word of God and to see how difficult it is in the community to get a good straight hearing on subject matters. I'm so thankful to be here. I pray, Father, you would bring us people that have a desire to know the truth, and the truth will set them free. Set them free about marriage and dating and courtshiping and all these things that have just been thrown under the rug and not discussed publicly and openly among our youth. That day is, that day is over. We are going to bring it to the young people because they're open to it. Nobody's telling them the truth. They can carry it home and tell their parents, their grandparents, as I did. I thank you, Father. I thank you for the opportunities that we have out here and for a great congregation of steady people. We look forward to 23 not only for home missions, but for foreign missions. In Jesus' name, amen.